Huge thank you to eBay for sponsoring this video. Be sure to click the link in the description below to go right to all the G.I. Joe collectibles you've been looking for. Everyone's heard of the circle of life. This is about the triangle of life. Comic books, cartoons, and action figures. Once established, each feeding into the marketing of the other, increasing visibility, building value, fueling the growth, development, expansion of the other. This is about the continuing legacy of the brand that did it first and did it best. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero is an animated series, comic books, and action figure line, a three-sided marketing and sales approach that began in 1982 that made such a significant cultural impact that the effects can still be seen today, nearly 40 years later. G.I. Joe was originally introduced by Hasbro in the 1960s, the boys' toys answer to the success that Mattel was having with Barbie. He was America's movable fighting man, the first action figure, a huge success for over a decade until 12-inch figures and terrestrial war itself briefly fell out of fashion. But as the 80s approached, Hasbro sought to bring one of their most successful brands back to the front. Bob Prupis, head of Boys Toys, was in charge of Operation Blast Off, the top secret product development project that would find a way to reinvent G.I. Joe for the new decade. Bob went back to the most basic idea of toy soldiers that he could think of, the simple green plastic army men that he and most kids had played with growing up. And it would have been irresponsible not to try to combine that concept with the success that Kenner was having with their three and three quarter inch Star Wars figures and vehicles. Kenner had already made the move to a smaller line of figures for two reasons. One, thanks to the oil embargo of the 70s, the cost of oil was skyrocketing, which meant that the cost to produce plastic products was going up as well. It made financial sense to decrease the size and complexity of the toys to keep the price down. Two, smaller figures which were more cost efficient meant that vehicles and play sets, which naturally had a higher price point, could be produced more cost effectively as well. On top of that, G.I. Joe would be the dream combination of two toys that kids had already proved they liked playing with. Toy soldiers and toy cars. And tanks and jets and boats and motorcycles. Upper management wasn't initially sold on the new smaller Joes. It wasn't exciting enough, but that didn't deter Bob and his staff. They kept working, trying to find the version that Hasbro would put a real investment into. In 1981, Bob got together with Hasbro's marketing agency, Griffin Bacall, to kick ideas around. With Kirk Bozigian and designers Ron Rudat and Greg Bernstein, the team resolved to find a way to make G.I. Joe work for the new era, to do something different to create excitement and move this potential new toy line. Kenner had feature films to sell their Star Wars toys. Hasbro wasn't going to make a movie to sell a line that had been dead for several years. And not for nothing, but there was no existing mythology to produce a movie around anyway. The next best option at the time, the next best way to reach that same target audience and tell stories was comic books. Griffin McCall's other partner, Marvel Comics, had already produced comic books based on toy lines like Shogun Warriors and Micronauts. Marvel was ideal to provide the mythology building necessary to engage the audience and create an emotional connection to the toys. On top of that, producing comics was going to be much cheaper and faster than making a movie, TV show, or even an animated series. With the goal of reaching the widest audience possible, Marvel was particularly excited by the idea of comic books being advertised on TV. Unlike toys, there were no rules and regulations about marketing comics to kids on television. Toy commercials had to meet all sorts of standards with respect to runtime, broadcast time, limitations on animation, depictions of the actual functions of the toys, and demonstrations with actual kids playing with the toys. Griffin McCall budgeted $3 million for a series of fully animated commercials that would technically promote the continuing adventures of G.I. Joe in the Marvel comics, but would also obviously showcase the variety of toys that would be available on store shelves at the time. In the triangle of life, each side depends on and feeds the others. This is a triangle. Hasbro and Marvel hit the toy shelves and the comic book racks while the 30 second spots ran on TV introducing the concepts of the battle between good and evil, the Joes versus Cobra, each commercial teasing the next adventure which would feature new characters or vehicles that were included in the line. In 1982, Hasbro released 13 G.I. Joe characters squared off against Cobra Commander and two Army Builder figures, a Cobra Officer and a rank-and-file Cobra Trooper. To help reinforce the stories in the comics, each figure featured a file card on the back of the package with classified information detailing everything about the character from birthplace to military specialties and endorsements from senior officers. It added another layer of collectability to a toy line already compelling kids to collect them all. 
Hasbro conservatively estimated $12 to $15 million in sales in the first year of the line, backed by the comics and television advertising. However, in a world without Transformers, with a year to go until the release of Return of the Jedi, G.I. Joe soared to over $50 million in sales, becoming the must-have toys of the holiday season in 1982. Hasbro, Marvel, Griffin Bacall, it was clear to everyone that this wasn't just a popular toy line, but had the potential to be a pop culture phenomenon, and the time to take advantage was now. Hasbro and Griffin Bacall set out to find some legitimate screenwriters to bring over to the world of kids' animation, normally a place where they would have to retire to once they were all washed up. Ron Friedman, who had worked on shows like Happy Days, The Andy Griffith Show, and Bewitched, had some ideas. In other words, a pilot of one 22-minute episode is not going to sell G.I. Joe. I suggested a five-part miniseries. So the kids would have time, and I would have time, to introduce groupings of characters and establish the families, because the family is the touchstone of all storytelling, of all drama. Ron gave a particular voice to the characters with the introduction of both the Yo-Jo and Cobra battle cries. He established the archetypes for the characters and how the different teams worked together. All of this in the interest of creating a compelling animated series that would build on the style and tone already established by the visuals in the commercials. As part of their marketing offerings, Griffin Bacall maintained an animation production wing called Sunbow Productions. Sunbow wrote the scripts based on the reference material provided to them by Hasbro. Sunbow worked directly with Marvel Productions, the film and television wing of Marvel Entertainment Group. Marvel Productions handled the storyboards and voice casting and then subcontracted the actual animation out to Toei Animation. It would be an understatement to say that there were a lot of moving parts involved in bringing this animated series to life. Everything began in 1983 with G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, a five-episode miniseries. It aired from September 12th to the 16th in 1983 on 122 stations. The plot centered on Cobra's creation of a teleporter called the Mass Device. It could be used to, say, steal a communications satellite, deploy an entire army of troops, or destroy the Earth's core. Both the Joes and Cobra attempted to collect the rare elements to power their respective mass devices before the other was able to. Ultimately, the show did exactly what it intended to, introduce the mythology of the world of G.I. Joe in a visually compelling way with all the drama that animated television can provide. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, the miniseries, would again exceed projections, scoring ratings that were better than those charted by the most popular Saturday morning cartoons. It would be followed by a second miniseries in 1984 called G.I. Joe, The Revenge of Cobra, with a similar plot device to the original series, wherein the Joes and Cobras have to locate all the parts of the Weather Dominator weapon before the opposition. And the success of that series would lead into the creation of an ongoing series in September of 1985. The first full season of G.I. Joe began with the rebroadcast of the two previous five-part miniseries, both written by Ron Friedman. Fifty-five more episodes were produced to get the series to the 65-episode minimum needed for syndication, the first five of which were a third miniseries written by Ron Friedman called The Pyramid of Darkness. Like the previous series, it served as a means to introduce new characters and vehicles to the line, climaxing with all of the old and new characters joining together to fight against the old and new forces of Cobra. Once the regular daily episodes began, the shows would shuffle the focus through the ever-expanding roster of characters wherever an interesting script presented itself. Hasbro, Sunbow, Marvel, everyone knew the game that was being played. Selling more to kids is always a risky, albeit successful, business model. That said, steps were taken to minimize the degree of danger related to the war being depicted. Bullets were replaced by red and blue lasers. Vehicle drivers, fighter pilots especially, could always be seen successfully escaping before potentially perishing in the explosion. And in an attempt to provide some educational value, each episode of the regular series ended with a 30-second public service announcement where a member of the G.I. Joe team would assist kids in learning a lesson about safety. Of the multitude of ideas G.I. Joe brought into the public consciousness, the most impactful by far for the generation that grew up with it is the closing tagline of those PSAs. It is the call and answer, the mantra that unites the fan base. Whether it was learning what to do if you caught on fire or warning against petting strange animals, G.I. Joe was there to make sure you knew what to do. And knowing is half the battle. Knowing is half the battle. And 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 knowing is half the battle. 1986 debuted the fourth five-part miniseries to kick off the next 30 episodes. It was the first attempt at a significant refresh of the line and the mythology. A Arise, Serpentor, Arise, once again took the Joes and Cobras on missions to collect a series of MacGuffins. This time it was the DNA of history's greatest and most ruthless military leaders in an attempt to engineer a new leader for Cobra named Serpentor. <laughs> 
That was the best take. <laughs> and since we're on the subject, let's not overlook the fact that after four or five episode miniseries, the Joes have a terrible track record of preventing Cobra from accomplishing their missions. Cobra successfully collected all the parts for the mass device, they recovered all the pieces for the Weather Dominator, they activated the Pyramid of Darkness, and they successfully stole DNA from ancient graves and tombs to bring Serpentor to life. Yes, the Joes ultimately defeated Cobra in each scenario, but not until after valuable time and resources were expended, and one has to assume a major loss of life and property on both sides and civilians around the world. Yo, Joe, come on team, this is what you trained for. If you can't get the job done, you're going to get replaced. Ryan, got your new cereal. How's it look, Duke? All clear. Go for it. Hit it! Introducing G.I. Joe Action Stars brand cereal, a delicious part of this complete breakfast. Crunchy stars that taste great. So, for all you action stars... Bye, Mom! G.I. Joe Action Stars! In 1987, the first G.I. Joe feature-length film was released direct-to-home video, featuring an all-star cast with names like Burgess Meredith, Don Johnson, and Sergeant Slaughter. The original intent was to release to theaters, but after unexpected production delays pushed the film back and the disappointing box office results of both the Transformers and My Little Pony movies, there was no other reasonable option. Transformers and My Little Pony had lost Hasbro a combined $10 million. That's enough to force Hasbro to cut costs on G.I. Joe and altogether kill the gem movie that was in development. G.I. Joe the movie would be cut up into the standard five-episode miniseries structure and broadcast later that year. The movie does exactly what the Transformers movie sought to do. Cycle out the old characters in favor of the new so the line can stay fresh and storylines can move forward. New concepts, new direction, new everything. While G.I. Joe had always had a science fiction angle to it, G.I. Joe the movie dives headfirst into the genre. Another move to potentially distance G.I. Joe from the realities of actual real-life war. G.I. Joe the movie tells the story of Cobra La, an ancient snake-centric civilization, masters of biological technologies. The time has come for their re-emergence from the shadows. After 40,000 years in hiding, a brilliant young scientist, disfigured though he may be, is named Cobra Commander and given an army to wage war against the humans. The disgusting humans who dominate the planet with their lifeless, inorganic technology, with culture that offends the nobility of ancient Cobra law. Cobra's ranks are reinforced with new additions like Golobulus and Nemesis Enforcer. The Joes land new recruits Jinx, Tunnel Rat, Chuckles, Law and & Order, and Duke's own half-brother Falcon. And like the Transformers movie, G.I. Joe attempted to have some significant, lasting consequences. They attempted to introduce a genuine sense of danger to the series by actually killing off a major character. However, Hasbro was not happy about the negative reaction to the killing of Optimus Prime in the Transformers movie, so there was no way they were going to permanently kill off Duke, the longtime leader of the Joes. After a quick rewrite and a line of dialogue, Duke recovers from the snake Serpentor threw into his heart after a brief coma. After the movie, Marvel Productions made some more commercials for the Marvel comic books with an eye towards a third season which would have focused on a criminal organization called The Coil, led by Tomax and Zaymot, and Cobra Commander's attempt to rebuild Cobra as, I don't know, he's some kind of talking snake commander or something. <laughs> Unfortunately, that third season would never happen. Marvel Productions lost the license to Deke Entertainment. The Deke Entertainment era of G.I. Joe Real American Hero began the same way the Marvel Productions era began, with a five-part miniseries called Operation Dragonfire. Right out of the gate, Operation Dragonfire reestablishes the key players, including the return of Cobra Commander and a slew of new characters and vehicles soon to be available in toy stores all over the country. The Deke era would last for two years from 1989 through 1991, a total of 44 episodes. While it is still the same continuity as the Sunbow era, everything was created uniquely for its run. While the cartoons were the biggest means of exposure, the comics had been there since the beginning and continued the entire time with a storyline that was, at times, aligned with the animated series, but for the most part, developed independent of the show. Different characters gained prominence in the comics versus the cartoon. Some characters' origins were completely different, but it gave Larry Hama, the writer for nearly every issue of the comic book and every file card in the toy line, the freedom to take the story wherever he wanted to. 
The comics were just as important to the legend of G.I. Joe as the toy line and animated series. The books provided the foundation for the toy line, and then the promotion set the stage for the animated series. The continued success of the cartoon and the toy line ensured the success of the comic book. G.I. Joe was unique among toy-centric comics at the time. There was no expectation that the toy line itself, much less the comic books, would last more than two or three years. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, lasted 12 years in its original run. It was the number one subscription book at Marvel for the year 1985. It served as an entry book to comics in general as kids migrated to other comics from G.I. Joe. Marvel sold over 150,000 copies of G.I. Joe per month in 1983. Thanks to the successful television marketing and the explosion of popularity through the animated series, that number jumped to 330,000 copies per month in 1985. That year, Marvel spun off a new title, G.I. Joe Yearbook, and then in 1986, G.I. Joe Special Missions. That same year, Marvel published G.I. Joe Order of Battle, a four-issue compilation of all the information from the file cards on the back of G.I. Joe action figures. And in 1987, the first four-issue crossover between G.I. Joe and Hasbro's other mega-hit toy line, The Transformers. G.I. Joe the Animated Series officially ended in 1992, leaving the action figure line support up to the comic book series. But times had changed, and most of the kids who had grown up with the line had moved on to other things. The comic book and the figure line would both end in 1994 after 155 issues and hundreds of action figures, vehicles, and playsets. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, and G.I. Joe the Movie were released on VHS in the mid-80s. Arise, Serpentor Arise was released on Laserdisc in 1991. Season 1 and half of Season 2 were released on DVD by Kid Rhino Entertainment in 2003 and 2004. In 2008, Hasbro reacquired the worldwide distribution rights to the Sunbow era of cartoons. As part of the 25th anniversary relaunch of the toy line, a DVD of each of the five-part miniseries were packed in with a themed set of figures. In 2009, Shout Factory re-released a complete collector's set, 17 DVDs with all 95 episodes of the Sunbow era. The set features a ton of bonus features, including toy commercials and a 60-page book. Today, most of the series is streaming for free at TubiTV.com. This version of G.I. Joe helped to solidify the importance of the transmedia narrative approach to marketing toys, multiple media formats telling parts of an overall story, each making the other more valuable, permeating every aspect of the entertainment experience, making the brand virtually inescapable. It's the version of G.I. Joe that has been repeatedly called back to duty by the fans who connected with it at the most receptive time of their lives. It is the version that established the characters that transcended their role in the mythology to become pop culture touchstones. It's the version that inspired live-action feature films in 2009 and 2013, comic book series from Devil's Due Publishing and IDW Comics, and even a return to the original continuity with original writer Larry Hama 16 years after the original comic book series was canceled. And just the other day, Henry Golding was added to the cast for a Snake Eyes movie currently pushed back to 2020 from 2019, from 2018, from 2017. Whether or not he'll be playing Snake Eyes is still unknown, or at least I couldn't figure it out. I'm not even sure there's a real script yet. Is this the one with Chuckles, or is that another thing? G.I. Joe Real American Hero was a rare reboot that was more successful than the property it was based on, with characters gaining global recognition and popularity in excess of what they had been for decades before. It impacted the lives of a generation of kids for over a decade, and even managed to communicate a message of diversity, hope, and unity through the lens of a war against terror while selling a whole lot of toys and comic books. eBay has all the collectibles you just can't get anywhere else, Vintage, rare, import, new, and old, the kind of stuff we showed off in this video. Take a look through the rest of the toys. You'll find things you used to own, things you forgot about, or possibly things you didn't even know existed. I thought my Ace McCloud was complete and had been since I originally purchased it back in 1986, but to my surprise, I was missing several accessories. Look, Ace went to the beach, to school, to Grandma's house. How are we going to shoot an episode about Kenner's Centurions without all the missiles and jet engines and wrist-mounted laser guns? I knew there was only one place to go. I knew eBay would have it. eBay is the place for collectibles, new, old, rare, vintage, one-of-a-kind, domestic, and international. All kinds of toys, action figures, accessories, play sets. Go to eBay today to find the thing you've been missing all these years. To get started today, click the link in the description below. Thank you for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you watched G.I. Joe, a real American hero, or if you've been staring at the screen this whole time saying, what is this action force knockoff I'm watching right now? For you folks, don't worry. We will get to it at some point. <laughs> It's coming. <laughs> Cut.